Hello and welcome to a virtual debate on integrative oncology, the missing link in Europe's beating cancer plan. A media partnership between Euroactive and Boiron, one of the leading companies putting homeopathic medicine at the forefront of healthcare. I'm Mary Zaidi, and I'll be your host over the next one and a half hours. And to everyone who is, of course, joining us online, thank you so much uh, for being here with us. We appreciate you being with us so much. And if you do, of course, have any comments or suggestions or questions for any of our panelists, do put those into our chat page, um, and I'll pick out some of those comments and questions later on in the program. So today we're going to be discussing integrative oncology. It's a holistic approach that puts patient well-being at the heart of cancer treatment and care. It combines both conventional cancer treatments such as chemotherapy, radiation and surgery, but also looks beyond that. It advocates for the use of complementary therapies such as homeopathy, acupuncture, herbal medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, um, in conjunction with, of course, traditional cancer treatment. And proponents say that this approach really does ease the suffering of patients, their symptoms, their side effects, and it can even help with the psychological effects of anyone who is, of course, diagnosed um, and is undergoing cancer treatment. Now, in November last year, the EU Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, she said um, that she wants to make cancer treatment and prevention a key part uh, of the EU Commission's health action plan. So Europe's Beating Back Cancer Plan um, aims to save three million uh, European lives by 2030 which the Commission believes is mission possible. Now, we do know that, of course, that the European Parliament is, of course, debating their own draft report and legislation um, on their cancer action plan, and, and they are debating over 1,500 amendments at the moment, and they hope that this legislation can really help support uh, national healthcare systems within the European Union. So the question then is, is complementary and integrative medicine really that missing link in the fight against cancer? Well, to answer that question will, of course, be a group of panellists and experts who, I might add, do fully advocate for it to be integrated into the standard care of treatment for cancer. But first are some introductory remarks from some EU politicians. And first, we're going to go to Spanish MEP from the European People's Party and chair of the petitions Petty Committee, uh, Delors Montserrat. Ms. Montserrat, welcome. Um, now, you've said that Europe has never been more prepared to beat cancer that it has to intensify efforts to achieve that goal by working together. So what more can be done? Thank you very much, and I'm so happy to be here with you. Well, you know, the cancer burden is estimated to have risen to 2.7 million new cases and 1.3 million deaths in 2020 in Europe. Cancer is responsible for more than 25 percent of total death in Europe, and it is the leading cause of death between the ages of 45 and 65, a number increasing every year. The European Cancer Plan represents an unprecedented step ahead in the fight to this disease, with a budget of 4 billion euro coming in particular um, for, from the new European Union Health Programme aim to foster greater cooperation between member states, complementing national cancer plans. The plan will facilitate knowledge sharing and addressing with 10 flagship initiatives for, our, for key areas in the fight to beat the disease. So prevention, early diagnosis and high quality, innovative and effective treatment, third quality of life for patients, caregivers and survivors and their families, and for the equitable access to all the stages of the disease and its cure. No? So one of the most important changes introduced by the plan is the approach to all the phases of the disease, including the quality of life of, patch and of patients in treatments, but also is post-treatment and the super survivorship that thanks to the most innovative and effective treatments every day, more available, keeps raising. So thinking of quality of life for patients, it is essential to remember that five years after cancer, 63% of patients suffer from sequel, 50 are limited in their um, physical activity, and 48 suffers from fatigue. So patients are looking for therapeutic solutions to the side effects and the sequel of their disease and their treatments. They find these solutions also in integrative oncology performed by healthcare professionals, which seeks to optimize health, biological conditions, quality of life and clinical outcomes throughout the cancer process, supporting and respecting conventional treatments. So integrative oncology shows scientific-based impact 
through greater resilience to disease and cancer treatment, greater well-being, longer life expectancy, decreasing relapse. So as I say, the, European, the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan for the first time integrates the quality of patients' life pillar and the Baker Committee report we're working on in the Parliament address in, it, it, it in various paragraphs. The speed that there is no mention to integrative oncology in the European Beating Cancer Plan, nor in the first draft of the Baker report, but I have draft amendments in this direction in the report of the Baker Committee, and I will do all I can to clearly include integrative oncology in the final text that will uh, will uh, accompany the Commission implementation of the European Beating Cancer Plan. To highlight the importance of complementary medicine and integrative oncology, this week the Parliament host two events to promote complementary integrative medicines. One was organized by the Health Working Group of the MV Commission, which I co-chair. In, in the Pharmaceutical Strategy for Europe report, for which I have been the rapporteur, we are shift to include a paragraph that highlights the need to foster and support complementary integrative medicine. So this is our small grid steps in the right direction to effectively improve the quality of life uh, of uh, all the European um, citizens. So let's keep working together to reach that goal. Thank you. It is a work in progress, but important uh, legislation by the European Parliament. Let's now go to Swedish member of the European Committee of the Regions, uh, and she is also their author on their action plan for beating cancer, uh, Birgitta Sekreder. Welcome to you. Uh, now, Ms. Sekreder, you, of course, advocate for a regional approach. I mean, you are a member of the European Committee of the Regions, after all, when it comes to cancer prevention uh, and care. And you say that by doing so, um, Europe can remove the disparities between care and treatment. So tell us more about how the regional approach differs. Well, uh, it depends. Uh, for example, in Sweden, the regions are responsible for, for the hospitals and healthcare. So, of course, we feel very uh, much involved. And uh, to be get a better um, knowledge, we have formed six cancer centers in Sweden. And these six cancer centers work together. And I think this is really, really good. And my wish is that maybe we could have a cancer center on EU level to collect knowledge and research. And especially when it comes to complementary and alternative alternative medicine because more and more people are asking for this in sweden is one out of four who use complementary medicine so this is what is so important for the future that we try as the former speaker said that um, good healthy lifestyles so the side effects can diminish because we have many survivors from cancer and they really need to have a good life and the quality of of a good life uh, there we can do some more research what is evidence based um, uh, have this approach for example prayers mindfulness uh, yoga healing uh, and also for uh, natural uh, medicine we need to know how they interact with each other, with um, other medicine, traditional medicines. Uh, so the most important is that we have this cancer knowledge uh, centers. So it will be reached out in, in um, local level. So the nurses and, and doctors, the health professionals knows about it also on local level. So they can deal with the people. And, um, I, I think also that uh, you were talking about fundings. I think also we must improve this research and fundings. So uh, the research together with the nat uh, natural medicine and in implementary um, medicine work together with the traditional and education and uh, information we need. And then maybe we should have also multidisciplinary working groups working together. But one attitude question is that 
cancer pa patients should feel free to have a dialogue with the health professionals about complementary medicine because sometimes that is not the case they are afraid to say something that they are using this but i think in the future the dialogue between the cancer patients and the medical caretakers should be more open so they can discuss the complementary and alternative medicine can thank you Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Brigitte Secretary. Also, of course, we're shining a light there on the specific treatment available at a regional level and for saying that there needs to be perhaps a better dialogue between the patient um, and um, the care provided. Uh, thank you so much to you both. Right, well, over now to our panellists. Um, we have clinician professor Michael Frost. Welcome to you. We have Dr. Elia Rossi, a general practitioner. We also have Eric Bulins, a patient representative from Belgium, and Anne Lord Leclerc, a representative from Boiron. Thank you all for joining. It's a pleasure to see you all, albeit virtually. Um, I think, you know, of course, for everyone who is joining, that any, uh, you know, debate or conversation about cancer care and treatment is always one that's worth having. Um, and of course, to understand who our panelists are, what they advocate for, what they're passionate about, they will now be given five minutes um, to talk um, on what they uh, want to present. Um, so first of all, we're going to go to Professor Michael Fraas, who's MD at the Medical University of Austria. He's also authored a study on homeopathy treatments for patients with lung cancer. Professor, you now have five minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I am very, very happy to talk about uh, cancer patients. I have treated cancer patients 15 years during uh, my work at the Medical University of Vienna. And uh, a, a colleague found that her patients treated with homeopathy had a better prognosis and a better life quality. So I will show you with the next slide uh, the results and the indications of our study. The main question was uh, to find out whether or not a homeopathic additive treatment in addition to complementary treatments such as chemotherapy, radiation therapy and or surgical therapy might help to improve life quality and to prolong survival with patients in patients with advanced lung cancer. It was a phase three prospective study and it was a computerized double blind randomization. So randomization was a very, in a very high standard and uh, this uh, also influenced the quality of the study. Four cancer centers were included and in addition we also had a new way to define exactly the time of uh, recruitment of the patient because they had to be diagnosed within the last eight weeks. And as already explained, all these patients were undergoing chemotherapy plus minus radiation therapy. Next slide. Now, the study design included altogether 150 patients with advanced stages of non-small lung cancer. 51 patients were included double-blind and randomized into the homeopathy group. They received conventional treatment and in addition, individualized homeopathy treatment, while 47 patients exclude the possible influence of a homeopath on the patients and on the uh, outcome parameters. We also created a third group, a so-called control group. Those patients uh, received only conventional treatment that did not, were not investigated regarding life quality, just uh, with regard to survival. So the 98 patients of the homeopathy and placebo group were evaluated for, 
with regards to life quality as well as to the well. Now, the evaluation of patients' quality of life was done by two old, very old, known questionnaires. One is the questionnaire of the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, the EORTC questionnaire, which is focusing on quality of life, especially in patients with cancer, and the short form, the V6 uh, questionnaire, which evaluates patients' quality of life with all types of pathology. And two questions, two questionnaires were filled in at the study entry, and then in the ninth and eighteenth week after the beginning of homeopathic treatment. Next slide. Now the primary end point was evaluation of patients' quality of life which means the homeopathy group versus placebo group and the parameters improved after nine weeks, 10 out of 14, while after 18 weeks, all parameters, all 14 parameters improved uh, in the homeopathy group when compared to the placebo group. And this was significant between the two groups in favor of homeopathy. Next slide, please. If you look to the primary endpoint, for example, pain and nausea were improved by 78%, while fatigue by 75%, appetite loss by 71%, and insomnia by 67%. All these reductions were significant uh, evaluated. Next slide. If you look to this uh, so-called Kaplan-Meier plot, which evaluates patient survival in all these three groups, you see that the upper curve is the homeopathy group. There were most of the survivors, and there was a significant improvement of the survival rate when compared to the placebo group, uh, the homeopathy group, and 45% uh, survival, the placebo group 23 and the control group 13. And the difference between the homeopathy and placebo group, as well as between homeopathy group and control group, was statistically significant. So this was really a surprise also for us, and we were very happy to find these results. Next slide. So here you can also see, maybe even more drastically, the evaluation of patients' survival, the mean survival time, was in the homeopathy group, 435 days, in the placebo group, 257 days, and in the control group, 228 days. So it was about six months difference between homeopathy and placebo group, and about seven months between homeopathy and control group. Next slide, please. Now, the survival results could be explained by the improvement uh, of the quality of life and a better observance of conventional treatments by alleviating side effects of, for example, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and or surgical therapy. And the study of the specific activity of the homeopathic treatment would be warranted. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, um, Professor Faraz, and thank you, of course, for sharing uh, your research and, of course, for highlighting um, the quality of life of patients. Now, next to Dr. Elia Rossi, he's the Director of Complementary Medicine and Diet in Oncology um, at the Campo di Mart Provincial Hospital of Lucca, Italy. Now, he says we must meet the unmet needs of cancer patients when it also comes to quality of life. Dr. Rossi, welcome, and you have five minutes. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, the slide, please. Uh, the slide. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Next slide, please. 
as you probably know, around 40% of cancer patients in Europe use complementary medicine. In 2011, the region of Tuscany was included in the Joint Action European Partnership Against Cancer, APAC, promoted by the European Commission with the aim to map cancer centers that provide integrative oncology across Europe. We found that um, 47% of responders to the questionnaire and 20% of the total provided integrative oncology treatment. Um, please, next slide. As you can see, the first graph in the slide showed the increase of integrative oncology centers in Europe since 2000. Uh, over the years. And, uh, and uh, you can see also in the second graph that uh, the complementary medicine more frequently provided to the cancer patient, which are agopuncture, homeopathy, herbal medicine, and anthroposophic medicine. Please, the uh, next slide. In uh, 2013, a public clinic of integrative oncology was set up in the public hospital Campo di Marte of Lucca, my town in Italy. Patient access to the clinic is free of charge, and so are the agopuncture treatments. The aim of the clinic is to improve the quality of life of cancer patients by reducing the side effect of anti-cancer treatment. We provide in our clinic diet advice and qualified information about evidence-based indication of complementary medicine and their potential interaction um, with anti-cancer drug. And we describe but uh, adapted complementary medicine solution to patient according to the side effect of their cancer. Next slide, please. From September 2013 to December 2020, uh, we're seen 645 patients. Today, they are 741. A type, main type of cancer observed are breast cancer, 60%, colon, lung, ovaries, and uterus. 80% of the patients are female, the mean age is 57, 30% of the cancer with metastasis, 10% with the cancer relapse, and 87.7% a second cancer. Next slide. Uh, next slide. The assessment of the intensity and frequency of symptoms before and after complementary treatment is generally measured with a grading system, while specific validated questionnaires are used for particular symptoms. You see in the slide the number of questionnaires generally used. In addition, in an ongoing study, clinical study in the Tuscany region, to assess the efficacy of complementary medicine in cognitive impairment of breast cancer, patient after anti-cancer term, so-called chemobrain, we use other several questionnaire and test. Next slide. We were uh, those uh, able to demonstrate the effectiveness of the treatment with a statistically significant reduction in the intensity of frequency of a number of symptoms such as, as uh, they say, we confirm what uh, Professor Frasser said just uh, few minutes before. Hot flashes, nausea and vomit, constipation, asthenia, anxiety, depression, insomnia, and also mucositis. Finally, we have significant result in reducing the intensity of radiotherapy-induced dermatitis, so-called radiodermatitis. Next slide, please. This important role that complementary integrative medicine can play as a supportive therapy for cancer patients is also recognized by the recently released published Breast Cancer Manual by the European Initiative for Breast Cancer, which states that breast cancer, breast unit should have a written policy and discuss the use of complementary integrative medicine within their structure. Next slide. Finally, I want to point out that we are in approval phase of the Tuscan Regional Guidelines, so-called Diagnostic Therapeutic Assistant Pathways, on the use of integrative complementary medicine in oncology. As a professor, General Director of the Regional Institute for Study Prevention and Oncological Networks, 
ISPRO of Tuscan region, has stated in several occasions, if a complementary treatment demonstrates its efficacy to improve cancer patient clinical condition, along with conventional treatment, of course, complementary therapy, it should be integrated with the, in the public health system to ensure it is made accessible to the highest number of patients. It becomes a climbable right by cancer patients. Thank you for your kind attention and I remain to your disposition for any uh, question you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rossi. I'm sure many people have many questions for you too. Uh, moving on to Eric Bulins. He's a patient representative in Belgium for the European Federation of Homeopathic Patients Association. Mr. Bulins, you also have five minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Bulins, if you could possibly unmute yourself. We think there might be a problem um, uh, yeah. with your sound. Perfect, lovely. Me. Please go ahead, uh, you have five minutes. Fantastic, sorry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As a patient organization, we know that uh, many people undergoing cancer treatment seek complementary therapies to ease the discomfort of chemotherapy and or radiotherapy. Most of those who have used CIM are satisfied. They say that the complementary therapy has enabled them to lead a more or less normal life. And people at the end of their life were able to maintain their dignity and serenity until they passed away. We, however, note that patients are not always well received in conventional oncology when they express their wish to use a complementary therapy. We do regret that some medical institutions still recommend that their patients avoid complementary therapies during cancer treatment. This may be justified when such a therapy may chemically interfere with conventional treatment. Yet there is no such chemical interaction with acupuncture, osteopathy, hypnotherapy, yoga, relax relaxation, and regarding homeopathy, the action of homeopathic medicines is not chemical in nature, as fundamental research seems to confirm. We find that quite a few patients use complementary therapies without the knowledge of their oncologist, simply to avoid pressure. And oncologists who don't know about their patients' complementary treatment are often very proud of the results and the little discomfort the patient experiences. Is this a pity or is this just funny? Pro Homeopathia, the Belgian Homeopathic Patients Association, calls on the entire medical sector to be more open. Although we admit that the situation is slowly moving in the right direction. The most beautiful manifestation of the scientific spirit is benevolent curiosity towards established phenomena, even if they question the current scientific conceptions. Science is constantly evolving and integrative medicine illustrates this. A simple request as a conclusion. Just try to imagine how much patients appreciate open-minded practitioners. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams, and thank you also for highlighting the fact that um, complementary therapy is something that perhaps patients are hiding from their cl clinicians, and that's something that we will pick up um, in our discussion a bit later. Uh, but finally, let's go to our media partner representative, Anne-Laure Leclerc. She is the Head of Scientific and Medical Affairs at Boiron, uh, who are pushing for more integrative centres dedicated to cancer treatment. Thank you so much uh, for also holding this event with us. Um, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Mariam, and thank you to all of you experts who gave us a great overview today. 
Um, now what I suggest is to take a small step back and to ensure that we all understand what integrative oncology is and to go back to the basic and to the definition of integrative medicine. Indeed, while um, this is a very common concept that is perfectly integrated uh, in the US, for instance, where it is fully part of the healthcare system, of academies, of scientific societies, this is still quite a new approach in Europe. Although you already shared many beautiful experiences today, there are no instances, there is no regulation or a very precise definition of what integrative medicine or integrative oncology are. So in a few words, if we had to describe what integrative medicine is, we could say that it brings to patient the best of both worlds, the conventional medicine and the complementary therapies at the service of the patient. Indeed, the patient is really at the center of this model. And what is very important is the coordination. The coordination is key because it means that healthcare professionals and therapists are working together in a multidisciplinary approach to have the best care for the patient. The patient in this model is really considered as a whole person with his emotional, cultural, psychological uh, aspects. And so you can see on this little picture that integrative medicine really embraces conventional medicine, of course, adding to it some specific uh, other very important disciplines of health, such as nutrition, physical activity, body and mind therapies, herbal medicines, and traditional healers such as homeopathy or acupuncture. And there are, of course, many other approaches. These are just some examples. And when we look at this model, what we can say that it's that it perfectly answers to the basic definition of health that the World Health Organization has given us. What is health? It's not only the absence of disease or infirmity, but it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And here we get closer to bringing a better health with integrative medicine. And so if you go to the next slide, when we define integrative medicine, we should absolutely not forget some fundamental pillars, essential aspects of it that are fully part of its own definition. Within integrative medicine, prevention is extremely important. Also, um, patients have an individualized care, meaning that two patients with the same disease might actually not get the same care pathway. So this is really a personalized approach. And within integrative oncology, patients are really involved actively in the management of their health. And when we look at these pillars, this also explains why us, Laboratoire Boiron, as a pharmaceutical company, we are fully aligned with this vision of medicine. And this is the medicine of the future, according to us. We are fully aligned with all these values. We develop some safe um, healthcare solutions, such as homeopathy, which aim to really help patients get a better quality of life and which helps patients to go through severe and chronic diseases such as cancer. And so this is why we take it as a mission to help integrative oncology spread throughout Europe. And we really try to raise awareness like we are doing today. And we are so happy that you could hear some very interesting experiences from healthcare professionals and from a patient representative. We also support um, advanced, advancing knowledge, for instance, through qualitative research on integrative oncology. And we try to support some initiatives because new initiatives, and this is what is wonderful, are emerging in Europe. Slowly but surely, we can see more and more integrative approaches and centers. And at Boiron, we try to make the most to support these initiatives. So this was a little bit of theory after all the practical uh, sharing. And I think now it's time for, for a debate and we're really happy to, to hear some questions and um, participate to this uh, great discussion around such a fascinating topic.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. McClare. And of course, it was, I think, really important there that you, you know, you really did inform the viewers who are perhaps not fully aware uh, of what uh, integrative oncology is, and you've sort of put it very concretely to them. So thank you so much for that. Um, and talking of our viewers, we do need more of your questions, so do put it into our chat page. Um, and please also do perhaps tell us who you'd like to answer those questions um, that you um, that, that, that you do, of course, have for the panellists. Okay, right. Well, as uh, Ms. Leclerc was saying, it is now time to open the debate section. Um, and so starting with Dr. Rossi, I'll come to you first. Is the Europe's beating cancer plan ambitious enough um, when legislation focuses on detection and prevention rather than improving quality of life, what you advocate for? Yes, of course, uh, it's not. I mean, uh, that uh, this uh, is a wanting uh, of uh, some very important uh, element, which is quality of life of the patient. Of course, uh, prevention is very important, but we have to be agree about uh, what we speak about uh, prevention. If uh, we uh, consider it a, a sort of uh, screening, uh, well, very important, uh, but prevention is uh, to act on the environment, act through the diet and uh, so agriculture and uh, the, 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 what the industries uh, are doing in the environment. This is uh, the real uh, cancer uh, prevention to work on, uh, on these uh, steps. Uh, quality of life is, uh, a, has an impact, important, a very important impact uh, on the compliance of therapy, which is directly connected uh, to the survival of the patient. If the patient can have uh, a good compliance with the anti-cancer therapy, uh, it has more chance to survive. And uh, so uh, it's not, uh, it's not a, a small thing. And then there is uh, this, uh, some phenomenon which uh, was uh, already mentioned about the so-called the long survivors, which have uh, uh, much to deal with the uh, quality of life. And this is uh, very important to have, to, to do what uh, is possible to do, to insert uh, this element uh, within uh, the, the European plan for in cancer. Something has been done, but uh, it's just a little bit uh, thing. Sure, no, and, and, and definitely you're right there. Uh, Professor Faust, maybe you could pick up on um, what Dr. Rossi was saying there, that really the EU's action plan isn't enough when it comes to improving quality of life. Is there anything you'd like to add to that first question? I think uh, the problem um, in, in Austria is that uh, the public health system does not support uh, homeopathic treatment or add-on treatment. While, for example, uh, in France, there's uh, Chiso, which uh, provides supportive uh, homeopathic treatment in oncological patients, as um, organized and initiated by Dr. jean Leonel Babot in Strasbourg. And uh, I think we have to work very much because what uh, some uh, insurances, especially in Germany, have found additional uh, homeopathic treatment reduces the costs for the insurances themselves and it also reduces the number of hospital stays uh, radically and statistically significant. So I believe even in oncological patients this might be an important issue because in some patients uh, chemotherapy has to be uh, interrupted because of side effects or adverse effects and uh, homeopathy has helped in several cases to reduce these side effects and to allow continuation of chemotherapy and this is uh, very important for these patients. Brilliant, thank you so much for that. Um, now over to Mr. Bulins. As a patient representative then, um, are there still some unmet needs, you would say, for cancer patients? And what then is the benefit of complementary approaches to answering this unmet need? There are indeed unmet needs. 
and uh, specifically it's specifically a matter of attitude i think um many patients complain about the the attitude of some doctors uh, you must understand that a patient is ill so he is to some extent in a minor inferior position towards the pr practitioner uh, and there is a tendency um, of some practitioners to, to play on that kind of superiority they have because of their, of their job, because of their knowledge. And uh, patients feel very uncomfortable and very few of them dare to speak up. Now, I can understand that they, indeed they have a problem to speak up because they, they are in need and they want solutions, not somebody who is giving lessons and, and moralizing. This needs to change uh, because I think indeed the oncology complemented with uh, additional therapies can be extremely efficient, but it's also a matter of welcoming patients. And there, there is still a lot to be done. No, definitely. And um, it seems to be a real shame that patients do feel that they can't speak up um, to their doctors. Um, Dr. Rossi, back to you. Now, you mentioned the growing development of integrative oncology models throughout Europe, but we are still sort of far away from a US model, um, which considers the integrative approach as fundamental and the basis of any cancer model care. Um, so why aren't complementary approaches better integrated within the European system? Do we need more integrative centers, whether they're public or private, perhaps? Uh, yes, Mariam, there is a big difference between uh, European situation and the USA situation. Um, there are uh, in the US uh, a, um, a lot of centers uh, um, connected uh, together uh, in uh, what is called a consortium of a university uh, providing complementary medicine uh, education and many of them also um, clinical service and especially in oncology. Um, uh, but um, there is a very big uh, difference uh, because uh, in um, our uh, uh, continent, in Europe, uh, many of the patients, uh, the country are uh, with the national health care system. So it's um, in, in United States, uh, all the uh, treatments are uh, paid by the patient at uh, different level. Uh, there is insurance, but uh, in general, they are private. In our situation, uh, our problem is how to insert uh, this uh, service, complementary medicine in oncology, um, the gate uh, in the public health service, uh, the gate uh, of access is uh, evidence-based medicine, of course, uh, and um, be, uh, but it's not so easy. There are different levels of evidence uh, according to the different complementary medicine. But uh, the problem for me is also uh, that uh, the policy level, uh, the stakeholder of uh, political stakeholder level, uh, they are who decide uh, what to insert or not. For instance, in, uh, in our region, uh, we insert complementary medicine according to this statement. Uh, medicine uh, treatments uh, who have a, a, a great uh, um, diffusion uh, within the population and have a sufficient level of evidence-based uh, evidence -based medicine, uh, proof of, uh, of uh, treatment, uh, efficacy of uh, the treatment. But who decide to what, what is sufficient? So we decided that uh, homeopathy, acupuncture, and herbal medicine has this uh, minimum level. And uh, um, also, uh, to be complementary to the oncological treatment is important because also for the oncologists because they have uh, in um, the possibility to uh, give to the patient the right level in time uh, in precise the time uh, of uh, chemotherapy therapy etc and also uh, we uh, give in our region uh, agoponture uh, free uh, of charge for the patient because we consider that uh, agoponto has uh, the uh, larger amount of uh, um, of uh, 
uh, evidence uh, and so the uh, larger, uh, strength, bigger strength of uh, recommendation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rossi. Um, Ms. Leclerc, um, let's just pick up on some of the points that Dr. Rossi made there. Uh, why do you think there is this lag between the US and the EU uh, when it comes to complementary care? And is he right in saying, pinpointing the fact that policy could actually be the problem in the EU? Yes, I definitely think that uh, policy has a great role to play in that. And when you speak of the US, we can take the example of the most famous, uh, most important American Society of Cancer, the ASCO, which actually fully endorsed the latest recommendation of the scientific uh, international oncology, integrative oncology uh, scientific society, for instance. So it means that a conventional medicine scientific society fully endorsed an integrative oncology recommendation. So far in Europe, we have some very beautiful initiatives, such as the European Society of Integrative Medicine, and also such as learned societies dedicated to specific integrative therapies, such as the ISCO or CISO, about, for, for instance, um, uh, what homeopathy can bring to cancer patients. But so far, these are totally disconnected from the conventional, I would say, uh, scientific society world, such as ECOESMO or big European uh, representative of um, cancer guidelines. So definitely, I think in the US at some point, the government decided to have a look at complementary therapies and to bring some funding to make some research and look into the evidence that they could find. And they found the evidence. And this is why now integrative oncology is fully inserted in academies, in um, anything related to health in the US. I think in Europe, we're still a step behind. But as uh, Elio said, uh, Dr. Rossi said, I think we still uh, can put in place some research program to make things, things advance in Europe to be listened by all this uh, more conventional medicine world and then by also the political world, of course. Okay, thank you, Ms. Leclerc. Um, Europe's stuck behind. Okay, so Professor France, is a barrier to integrative complementary therapies in cancer care. Um, the potential is basically economic, is the potential economic burden to patients when it comes to complementary therapies in cancer care one of the main barriers, what would you say? Uh, yes, I believe uh, it is because in Austria, the social insurances, which are otherwise very generous, uh, do not support the uh, homeopathic treatment unless you can prove that uh, there was no other means of uh, supporting the patient or help uh, in his uh, health condition. So, uh, as long as patients were treated in the hospital, and this was very well accepted by patients in the Department of Oncology of uh, the Medical University of Vienna, uh, then it could also be used by patients with a smaller financial uh, potential. And, uh, of course, uh, if you are treated by a homeopath uh, in this uh, uh, office, uh, the uh, may be a burden or maybe may prevent patients from taking homeopathy. So I believe uh, it should be somewhat similar as what I believe is uh, still possible in Germany that uh, the insurances allow homeopathic or other complementary therapies and maybe in the future I'm just dreaming you would have the situation as in India that uh, uh, there is a special ministry for at least five complementary therapies, including homeopathy. And what we have heard also from the current situation uh, with uh, Corona, that uh, homeopathy treatment was very, very successful. And I think this should be kept in mind uh, because uh, as, as well known, homeopathy has been very helpful uh, during uh, previous um, epidemics. So we are working and we try to convince, convince uh, uh, patients uh, and politicians uh, to support the patient, and, uh, but this is still a long way 
until acceptance. Uh, but we are still optimistic. Right, and Professor Bahas, uh, for us, you've also done, you know, so much research um, on this issue. Let's talk about the cancer patients in Austria, the ones that you've treated. Um, are they, or the ones you haven't treated perhaps, um, are they given complementary approaches via the public health system? No, the public health system does not support. Uh, and if you um, treat a patient and the patient wants to, um, he, to get some reimbursement from the public health system, uh, he gets about 5 to 15 euros. <laughs> this does not cover the cost of uh, 90 minutes or even longer uh, history taking of the home Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Williams, there, you heard what Professor Frass said, that, that, that patients only get back 5 to 15 euros. That's not a lot, really, is it? So is the cost, the lack of reimbursement there of complementary approaches, an issue that can then prevent patients um, from getting the most efficient management of their condition? I don't think so. Uh, because you mentioned very low, uh, very low amounts. Uh, and indeed, the, the reimbursement is very, very weak, very low. Now, you must say the, the cost of homeopathy for patients is not excessive. Uh, and it will never, I don't think it will ever uh, discourage uh, patients from relying on homeopathy. It is a, a, a cheap form of medicine, which doesn't mean that it is low quality, in, on the contrary, but it is really affordable and therefore uh, no patient will ever uh, renounce uh, homeopathy just because, uh, because of money. Okay, um, but a follow-up question, Mr. Bielensen. What do you think of Dr. Rossi saying that um, his patients are given free acupuncture? Um, is that a bigger cost to the system, perhaps? Is that something that could perhaps be integrated uh, across Europe? Would be nice. <laughs> would be nice. Uh, the question is, uh, what what practitioners would be ready to do so? Um, yeah, the same the same holds true for homeopathy and all other CIMs. Uh, it would be nice if if we could afford it. The question is, we, who will budget that? I don't know. I, I don't have the answer. <laughs> no, sure. Um, if something is given for free, I'm sure many people would avail of it. Um, okay, so Dr. Rossi, now we've discussed the cost uh, very specifically uh, about complementary medicine. Now, in your region, um, as you've spoken about it, you've managed to really effectively reimburse patients for the cost of their integrative care. So how could this become um, something that is seen more widely across Europe? Well, in our region, there is no reimbursement. Uh, is a free access uh, to the visit uh, and uh, to the cycle session of agopuncture. Uh, homeopathy and um, um, botanicals, uh, herbal medicine, are paid by uh, out uh, of the pocket of the patient. But um, to achieve this uh, result uh, was a process uh, that in our region start more than 20 years ago, a uh, process of integration of complementary medicine and uh, homeopathy uh, within uh, the health, public health system. Uh, we, uh, you, you may take in, in count that uh, in our region, um, in general in Italy, all the uh, treatment uh, and the, the diagnosis, test, uh, RX, uh, whatever, for cancer patient is completely free. And uh, uh, so, is very it's a problem to give or to support the patient with other complementary medicine which are not which are paid by, by the patient so we uh, achieve this result to have uh, a um, possibility to to give the patient the opportunity to use this uh, kind of therapy um, then you you must uh, uh, taking in consideration that, uh, as uh, the colleague said before, uh, in representative of the patients, uh, um, uh, the cost uh, relatively 
economic of uh, this kind of uh, therapies and also uh, the approach, we can say, non-pharmacological to the treatment, which means not to add other pharmaceutical product to other important anti-cancer treatment, which are sometimes very toxic for the patient, which means that to give to the patient some chance to be um, detoxified of the treatment and to have a, a better compliance. This is a, a very good result for everybody in our region. And then uh, the last uh, uh, thing I, I, I can say uh, at, that uh, we have, uh, we need of course uh, more evidence uh, to uh, in, in insert. But uh, you have to take in account also that uh, every country in Europe has different kind of uh, uh, health national system and there is insurance like in Germany, there is a, a very federalistic uh, system like in Italy or in Spain and uh, there is more centralistic like in France. So it's not easy to find uh, um, the, the, the right solution for each different country in Europe. And finally, I can say that we need to create a, like, a large, a very large front uh, putting together oncologists, um, politicians, uh, uh, and also university, um, the college, uh, the medical college, and also um, also the nurses and the other health uh, uh, technicians uh, to arrive to build up uh, a very important uh, mass of people asking with the patient uh, this uh, uh, to respect the right. Uh, to be free to treat uh, themselves with uh, uh, the uh, best uh, uh, opportunity of uh, therapy. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rossi, for that innovative approach. And, you know, if you are hearing um, everything the panelists are saying and you have some questions, of course, put those into our chat page. Okay, Professor Frost, coming to you now next again. Uh, regarding research programs, now, the draft report by the European Parliament, um, I'll just quote it here, it calls for sustainable and adequate funding for competitive European research on cancer. Um, it calls for at least a 20% increase in the mobilization of both public and private private research on therapeutic and diagnostic cancer innovations. Now, talk to us how you financed your clinical trial. Did you get any public support? And was that then perhaps, or would you say there's a burden then when it comes uh, to research and clinical trials going forward? Uh, may I first uh, add something to the public health system before? Our previous open pragmatic study was now included in the uh, German guidelines for oncological patients. So uh, it is a can policy and maybe this might also influence politicians. Now to your uh, question. Uh, our study was not supported by public funds. Uh, the main problem is in general in all medical fields uh, the public uh, support in Austria is very small. And if, you, if it comes to homeopathy or complementary therapy, it's uh, even smaller. So I was just relying on private sponsors, and without my private sponsors, uh, it would not have been possible to perform this study. And this was especially difficult because uh, I was also forced to finance uh, statistical evaluation uh, by our group. However, this at least uh, made our results even more reliable because the planning uh, statistician and the evaluating statistician were two different uh, groups and so there was no influence possible from one to the other group. But we need much more money for funding. Now, it's, uh, there's some European uh, health plans, especially in veterinary, uh, veterinary and homeopathy, because as it's well known, the European Union health plan uh, says that uh, animals uh, should be treated primarily by homeopathy and uh, only if homeopathy does not work. So, uh, 
uh, conventional medicine, medicine should be used. So I'm very hopeful that the research may go into this direction and may be supported at least by the European Union. Okay, um, so Ms. Leclerc, um, Professor France there was talking about a real problem when it comes to money and funding. Um, so can pharmaceuticals perhaps, like yourselves, like Boiron, um, fill the funding gap? Well, of course, we can add uh, um, our stone <laughs> to building this this huge wall. And um, uh, I think, the, the first of all, the clinical trial of Professor Fress uh, was really a beautiful study. And the fact that it was fully independent also adds to its quality and, and relevance. And um, I would like to say that um, currently there is really a body of evidence towards the interest of complementary therapies and homeopathy. Uh, on um, uh, supportive care in oncology. So, of course, as a pharmaceutical company, uh, we do research and we promote high-level research. First of all, we have our own pipeline um, with a vast, I would say, array of um, different methodologies of research. So, it includes randomized control trials, like Professor Fras presented us a uh, gold standard <laughs> example. Um, but also we are trying to focus on some more real life studies and observational studies that take into account some patient reported outcomes and that help to understand what's really going on in the real life, um, which really adds to these uh, very standard clinical trials um, uh, like Professor Fras introduced us. So many different kinds of studies are led right now. Uh, including showing a positive perception, more and more positive perceptions of healthcare professionals towards complementary uh, therapies and uh, more specifically homeopathy. Also high satisfactions of patients because we have to listen to what patients feel and say about that. And this is also uh, a topic for uh, clinical studies. Um, and then, for example, we are currently publishing an observational study at Boiron uh, that was led on nearly 100,000 breast cancer patients uh, to objectivize the benefits of homeopathy on their quality of life. So this is a part of what we can bring, uh, our own research. But of course, we also support some uh, initiatives like integrative oncology centers or initiatives that have their own evaluation uh, methods and um, we help uh, finding the right way to evaluate a global uh, integrative oncology approach as well as evaluate each uh, therapeutical approach and what it can bring to this model and i think this is really what we need to advance and what we are trying to do and we work together with researchers and with healthcare professional teams uh, to try to put in place these models that can tomorrow uh, really show the evidence of uh, the benefits of integrative oncology. Although, of course, we already have great examples that have been presented today. So that this is what we can do at our level. We cannot completely fill the gaps. Of course, fundings are still cruelly needed uh, in this field. And so far, uh, not so much coming from um, health authorities or national health systems or authorities, unfortunately. Well, let's hope that companies like yourselves can fill that funding gap, at least um, just a small part of it. Um, now, Professor Faraz, I'm going to come back to you because Mr. Leclerc obviously was complimenting um, and saying very good things about, of course, your clinical trial. Um, now, the results of your clinical trial, they are quite compelling. How do you explain the impact on survival when it comes to complementary homeopathic treatment? So, I think as in all other patients, if you are... Uh, Working with individualized uh, homeopathy, uh, it may help to improve the patient's constitution or, let's say, also the patient's life quality. And, uh, and we all know if we are in a good condition, then we are very strong against all offenses uh, of uh, this life. So, with the improvement of life quality, uh, this obviously leads also to a prolonged prolongation of survival. And there's a study uh, I would like to cite. It has been uh, performed by Dr. Montozzeri some years ago, and he investigated in a meta-analysis uh, several conventional studies, not on the basic, but conventional studies. And he found uh, in uh, cancer patients 
the improvement of life quality also improves survival. So I strongly believe that the improvement of life quality itself is also uh, responsible for the prolongation of survival. But anyway, whatever, uh, um, uh, I think survival is one thing. The other thing is uh, already mentioned by Mrs. Leclerc and Mr. Pullens is that uh, I think it's so important even to improve uh, small problems. Sometimes it's nothing which uh, appears to be very important for conventional medicine, but for the, to the patient and uh, his or her relatives, it's very helpful if even small uh, minor symptoms disappear or improve. So altogether, I think homeopathy helps in any stage of tumors, and therefore I hope that it will become a part of the public health system in the future. Okay, thank you, Professor Voss. Um, Dr. Rossi, I want you now to jump in um, and talk about impact survival and the results of your patients. Um, can you also tell us the approach that you take when it comes to your patients? Well, we, first of all, we have um, a, a double uh, professional uh, in, in our clinic. Uh, one is me as expert of homeopathy and uh, complementary medicine. The second one uh, is an oncologist that uh, help uh, uh, to uh, interpret and uh, to uh, clarify all the problems uh, from oncological point of view as the patient. Uh, the patient are coming from uh, uh, the uh, oncology center of our hospital, but uh, they can come also directly by if they want. As I told before, they don't pay the, the ticket uh, of the, the visit. They receive a visit and they receive a treatment, which is a mainly homeopathic treatment, but not only, depends on the symptoms. And also they receive, uh, we speak a little about this, uh, uh, diet advice, uh, how to uh, try to change the diet uh, of the patient uh, using uh, um, using uh, natural food, uh, uh, reducing uh, um, white uh, flour, uh, carbohydrates, uh, uh, using uh, less uh, uh, meat, uh, um, and, uh, and so on. What we call uh, anti-inflammatory uh, diet for oncological patient, uh, according to some uh, ideas that uh, are a uh, long uh, time uh, spreading in Italy. And then, um, especially during uh, the chemotherapy uh, session, we advise uh, to uh, make a, a hypocaloric, uh, or maybe sometimes fasting if it's possible, the day before, the, day, the same day, the day after, to reduce the the uh, importance of uh, the uh, adverse effect. Then after the patient, after the visit, the patient received the treatment, but uh, sometimes they advise to go to the acupuncturist uh, if uh, they need, uh, generally alternating with the treatment, the homeopathic treatment. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, they are sent back uh, to the oncologist department because uh, between the different control visits uh, something happened and uh, they have to be uh, more controlled and checked by uh, their oncologist. And they, they fix uh, a second, uh, a second uh, control visit, uh, which is generally after one or two months, it depends of, uh, of, the, of the, um, uh, the con clinical condition of the patient. I want to say two things about uh, what uh, Professor Fras and uh, other people say before that. Uh, one is that uh, uh, the, the research uh, uh, is not very much supported but, uh, by public uh, institution in Italy, but the uh, Tuscany region is something made in this sense uh, because our research about uh, chemo brain and complementary medicine is sustained, uh, founded by uh, Tuscan region and other two projects uh, about uh, the use of uh, agopuncture in um, uh, asthenia, fatigue uh, after radiotherapy, and uh, the other is uh, cannabis for uh, pain, anti-aromatasis pain uh, 
uh, in cancer patient are uh, were founded by uh, um, Tuscany region. And uh, this is uh, a, a, a little things, but uh, it's important because uh, it's uh, one of the first time that uh, in uh, Ital Italian situation uh, was uh, a, a public uh, finance of, uh, of uh, um, complementary medicine clinical studies. Thank you, Dr. Rossi. Uh, Mr. Pilius, I'm going to come to you next um, and to touch upon what both Dr. Rossi and Professor Frost uh, have been speaking about. So you've got two panellists there who are really talking up the results, um, especially for survival, using complementary um, treatment and medicines. Um, so... I want to go back to what you talked about a little bit earlier, uh, Mr. Bulins, that you said that many patients use complementary therapies without the knowledge of their oncologist simply to avoid pressure. So are cancer specialists really so negative? Why is it that they don't trust this? That's a good question because there is a, a lot of fundamental research conducted in homeopathy which led to impressive uh, results, uh, excellent, excellent studies published. And in the meantime, uh, the skeptics still continue to disregard the, that evidence. And uh, we, we remain in a situation where there is an opposition between the pros and the cons. And in the meantime, in between them, there, there are the patients, you see. And uh, they, they, I can assure you, the patient feels that that conflict very much. And uh, indeed, a lot of patients simply don't speak about about the complementary therapy to the conventional doctor, uh, simply because, well, they don't want to be involved in that in that conflict. I, it would be great if. The, the fundamental research that is conducted in complementary therapies uh, was better, how would I say, uh, officialized, bet, better recognized and accepted uh, by the scientific community. There's still a lot of to be done. And I think that the patients, be it in oncology or whatever other field, they would feel much more comfortable if at last, there was some evolution in the mentalities. Much well, um, it's been great to hear what all you had, uh, what all of you had to say um, during this debate. But now we're going to go to the audience comments, suggestions, um, and questions, and see what they want to ask all of the panelists. Okay, so first of all, um, and apologies if I do um, mispronounce your name, um, we're going to go to the question by Michael van Wassenhoven, and he says, in the frame of patients' free choice of therapy, any healthcare institution must be able to offer a right answer to each patient asking for complementary medicines. If this competence is not available in the institution, then they have to get some external cult, um, consultancy. And then he says, his question really seems to be, what would be the best way to have integrated medicine inside all healthcare centres, and when will this be possible? Perhaps, Miss Leclerc, you could go first. Well, I think that would be the ideal world if uh, complementary and integrative medicine could integrate all these uh, centres. I think we have the chance to see some initiatives in our European countries that are slowly going to make the evidence, the proof of concept, as we say, uh, that uh, this approach is relevant. And hopefully more and more centers will uh, take this uh, as a new model and will build on it. I think this is how it's going to come organically, naturally. And of course, uh, if any support still is coming from uh, policies and governments, this will accelerate it. So I don't have the answer now <laughs> to say when this will be um, the, um, uh, a common thing to see integrative uh, uh, care in all uh, private centers or public centers. But um, we have good hopes that this will um, come natural way, just like it it did in the US because at the end, this is what patients ask. We have now evidence that it improves patient quality of life. It even improves patient survival. So it means uh, it improves also healthcare system economics. 
So I think now we have all the evidence and it's just a matter of um, putting it uh, into action. Okay, thank you so much. And I hope that answered uh, your question, Michael. Um, over to a question by Oana Lacob Leroy. I'm sorry if I again mispronounce that name. Um, she asks, uh, how do you see integrative oncology in Europe in the future? First of all, let me go to Dr. Rossi, but then I'd also like uh, Professor Farras to also um, reply to that question. But first to Dr. Rossi. Um, ma'am, I, I think that uh, really uh, is a, a, a growing phenomenon. Is a growing phenomenon due one uh, thing that uh, uh, speaking about uh, integrative oncology, we speak about uh, a, a complementary uh, treatment, uh, which is uh, allied uh, allied to the uh, oncologist and the um, uh, anti-cancer treatment, not alternative, not against, but with, uh, together. And uh, this uh, can be uh, very useful for the patient, first of all, but also for the, uh, for the oncologist. Just uh, one thing to, to, to point out, uh, according to our experience, uh, 10 years ago, we were uh, not at the first uh, stage of our process of integration, but uh, in the middle uh, of this process. Uh, a survey made by the public institution uh, told us that uh, people, uh, in general, people uh, speak with uh, their uh, medical doctor, family medical doctor, and also their oncologist in the proportion of 60, 67% about their treatment, uh, complementary medicine treatment. It means that uh, if you are integrating, uh, you know each other, and of course there are skeptics everywhere and uh, uh, forever probably, but uh, the most uh, of the uh, family doctors, the most of uh, part of uh, oncologists uh, are, uh, uh, are in a uh, uh, friendship uh, and uh, in uh, agreement uh, with uh, this kind of, uh, of treatment. Um, the more you integrate, uh, the more you can uh, be uh, in, in, a, in a connection with uh, the oncologist, uh, with uh, the uh, conventional uh, medical doctor. Uh, it doesn't mean that the problem is solved, but uh, is, uh, on, uh, is important. So in, the, in this respect, uh, the perspective, especially in integrative oncology, I see very, very, um, a very important uh, evolution. We have in Italy, uh, there was nothing before uh, two few years ago, um, clinical courses, uh, master at university, a master in different cities, uh, there are uh, open of uh, new uh, uh, clinics, there are about uh, uh, 36 or 40 clinics in other part uh, of Italy, included uh, Toscany, but not only in Toscany. Um, we were very helped by this uh, uh, federalistic system, so we can have uh, in a small uh, level, uh, the regional level, more possibility to, um, to have uh, opportunities than uh, in the national level. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rossi. Um, and so, Professor Franz, if you could uh, also answer this question then, how do you see integrative oncology in Europe in the future? A question from Iona Flacob Leroy. <laughs> I'm always optimistic, and I believe that uh, mankind may make uh, progress. And if you look at all the polls and all the surveys um, in Europe, and I just know the, one of the latest uh, polls Germany, at least 80, but even up to 90% of Germans uh, would like to integrate uh, homeopathy and some other complementary therapies into the national health system. And there was also a paper published on uh, uh, parents of uh, children with cancer, and at least 80% wanted to integrate homeopathy the uh, hospital system. And I think we are just working to uh, convince uh, people and politicians uh, that it is uh, not a problem, and the opposite, it may be advantageous for uh, all the, for the population 
to integrate uh, the complementary therapy into the national health plan. And uh, this is uh, also uh, some something which we uh, have just uh, published a book of the Austrian Association of Holistic Doctors uh, about integrative, integrative medicine, emphasizing especially also the scientific part of each method. And the main thing is that we need more presence, of course, in the general medium. Uh, it's not easy to uh, find a way we have quite good connections to print media and but we also have to convince uh, television that we can show more uh, presence. So us. Okay, so uh, we are slowly um, getting very near to the end. So, Mr. Bulloons, there's a question for you. I'm going to ask you to try to be as concise as possible. Um, and I'll actually direct two questions to you. So, there is one from someone called MMRP, nice acronym, and also from Dorita Mac. I apologize for my pronunciation there. Okay, so for Mr. Bulins then, the cost of homeopathic medicine may be cheap, but the practitioner isn't. Um, it takes time and study to find the correct homeopathic remedy for each patient. Home homeopathy does not work with standard remedies. Then a follow-up with Dorita, she says, back to uh, Mr. or Mrs. Um, MMRP, that it's not true. Lots of support can be done from clinical homeopathy. Um, I have a good example in my family. So, Mr. Williams, what do you make of those comments and questions? Well, I'm, I, must, I must say that uh, experience shows that in acute uh, pathologies, the, the effect of homeopathy can be extremely fast in a matter of hours. Uh, in, in chronic diseases, indeed, it is much more difficult to find the, 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 right, the right remedy, the right medicine. Uh, now, you, you must understand that uh, the choice of the medicine is based on the interaction between the, the doctor, the homeopath, and the patient. Uh, not all patients are open and speak up openly. Uh, and that can be that can be slowing the whole process of of selecting the right uh, medicine. It 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 can be uh, a difficult process. I I admit that, and uh, and it can discourage some patients, and especially if they are in a hurry to find to find a solution for for their illness or their pathology. Uh, well, that, that is specific of homeopathy, but once you have found the, the correct medicine, it can be really impressive, I can tell you. I'm sure it can be. Um, okay, well, thank you to um, everyone who is watching who has, of course, put in those questions. Um, I hope that you've got the answers that you were looking for. Um, we are, of course, uh, down to the last sort of five minutes uh, of our debate. So. May I ask all of our panelists for their final thoughts? And I will go to Miss Leclerc first, please, if you may. But please do keep it short, about one minute, if you can. Of course, Miriam, thank you. Well, um, I think this was really um, amazing to hear all these testimonials today. And it shows that definitely integrative oncology is the future of um, cancer patient care. Um, still, some advances need to be made, uh, especially at European level, where for now there is not so much consideration about uh, this model. And also at national levels by each authorities that need to endorse this model, because now we have the, the evidence and we heard today many ways of uh, evidence, that the patients, testimonials, the clinical trials, uh, the clinics that put in place this model, everything is positive. And uh, it is such a shame that um, there is still some difficulty of integration of complementary approaches, such as homeopathy, within um, healthcare systems. So I hope that uh, this will, uh, working together, private and public institutions, patient associations, healthcare community, uh, will all together make things move uh, towards um, a more systematic integrative approach. Of course, at Laboratoire Boiron, we will keep ra raising awareness and supporting initiatives throughout Europe uh, on this uh, beautiful approach. And I really want to thank everyone for their attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Claire. Okay, over to Dr. Rossi. Have about a minute, please. Final thoughts, please. Oh, yes. Uh, it's uh, 
Well, I, I think that um, I want to encourage a patient and uh, also professional uh, everybody to use uh, homeopathy and uh, and other complementary medicine uh, because uh, they are uh, holistic, uh, centered on the person treatment, uh, uh, efficacy and uh, uh, sustainable uh, as regards the cost and also green for the environment and also respective of the different uh, beliefs and culture uh, of uh, uh, people, uh, especially now in a multicultural uh, society. This is uh, important uh, for us, for all the inhabitants of our uh, European country and the world, but also uh, for the young people, uh, because uh, young people are so passionate about the environment, the global uh, uh, problems of uh, environment can be uh, convinced to use uh, complementary medicine, which are uh, completely in line or uh, uh, in line of their beliefs. So I think that uh, the future is uh, great, but uh, uh, the obstacles uh, to this pathway are numerous and uh, important, uh, very strong. So we need uh, the maximum of uh, unity and uh, uh, connection um, among uh, our uh, sector, uh, different professional of our sector, and a straight, uh, very straight alliance with the, the patient. We are our strength uh, since ever. Thank you so much, Dr. Rossi. Over to Professor for ask your final comment, please. Uh, I look forward to this, uh, more uh, possibilities for students to learn uh, homeopathy, so it becomes a natural uh, source for colleagues, even those who are not um, working on homeopathy themselves. And uh, I believe that uh, if we have uh, more impact, as just Dr. Rossi just says, said that we look to the environmental problems, um, we are just uh, looking to the uh, mass of uh, conventional medicines polluting uh, the environment. I think it's really uh, preserving resources and it's a smooth method. So I know people like it, population likes it, and we have just to convince uh, politicians and academic colleagues that homeopathy is not frightening anyone. It's just helping and it's a win-win situation for everyone. Thank you so much, Professor Franz. Frightening, but help. Not frightening, but helping, I should say. Um, lastly, but not least, uh, Mr. Bulens, over to you. Well, mainly, I, I would I would see two two problems that need to be solved because, uh, indeed, the situation is evolving in the right direction slowly, as I said. Uh, but still, a lot has to be done in the general media. Uh, to promote uh, integrative oncology and integrative medicine generally uh, and to go beyond the misconceptions and the ignorance that still prevail about uh, these sectors, these disciplines. Um, this is one point. And the second point that needs to be uh, resolved quite quickly is the lack of young homeopaths. Uh, the uh, the average age of homeopaths in uh, in Belgium is above 60. Uh, there there is no there are very few young people starting in in this discipline and they, that will be a problem in a very in a very sh uh, short lapse of time. So these are the, the the two elements I would conclude with more more attention of the general media and more young homeopaths. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bulens. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave it there, but to Mr. Leclerc, uh, Dr. Rossi, Professor Fraz, and Mr. Bulens, thank you so much for being part of this debate. We also thank MEP Dolos Montserrat and Brigitte Sacredeur from the European Committee of the Regions. Thank you for uh, opening um, our discussion. And of course, to everyone who is watching, um, I really hope that what you've seen has really given you, you could say, a flavor of the debate surrounding 
Integrative Oncology. I'm Maren Zaidi, and you've been watching a debate organized by Boiron with Euractiv as media partner. Take care. Bye-bye.